Now, Professor Girardi uh, will introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Professor Girardi. Now, Professor Girardi uh, will introduce the next speaker. Okay. Thanks, Professor Girardi. Hello, uh, Guilherme. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alessandro Girardi. I'm professor at Federal University of Pampa in Alegrete, Rio Grande do Sul. I will be the chair of the session of this workshop promoted by IEEE CAS Rio Grande do Sul chapter. Uh, thank you all for attending to this session. And today we have the pleasure to introduce Professor Helmut Grab from Technical University of Munich in Germany for a very interesting talk about analog AC design automation in a different perspective with yield analysis in a deterministic way. I think this will be a, a very interesting, not only for analog designers, but also for digital and mixed signal designers, as more and more these domains are approaching when we talk about yield and optimized circuits. Uh, it's maybe the first time Professor Helmut will speak for Brazilian microelectronics community. I think he can confirm this, uh, although his vast experience in analog design automation. Uh, his short bio is since 1987, he has been with the chair of the electronic design automation at TU Munich, where he has been the head of research group since 1993. His research interest is in the design automation for analog mixed signal circuits. He has published more than 200 papers, six of which were nominated for best papers at DAC, ICCAD, and DATE conferences. Uh, he's also the author of the book Analog Design Centering and Sizing, which is an excellent reference for analog design automation. I use it a lot in my work. Uh, well, this session is being transmitted in the CAS RS chapter YouTube channel, and people can make questions for Professor Helmut in the chat. I'll read the questions at the end of this presentation. So, Helmut, good to see you again. Thank you again for being here. The floor is yours. You can begin. Okay, now, can you please confirm that you can see my slides and that you can hear me? Because I yes. don't see anything else. Everything else is okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Alessandro, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, you still did too much flattering anyway, but thank you very much. So um, what I want to do today is more a kind of lecture. It is about um, giving you an idea that you can um, go into what we know as yield analysis, not just with statistical methods like Monte Carlo that probably everyone knows, but also in a specific deterministic way. This is actually the main message of this talk today. So let's go on. Uh, let me just switch to this one here. So here is a short outline. First, we have to do some definitions. We want to talk about what is a performance, what is a parameter, what is simulation, and what are variations? What's the variability in a circuit? And then we will briefly review what probably all of us know. So doing a statistical yield analysis by Monte Carlo. And then we will get to this new well, old idea, but I want to tell you a little bit about that idea and kind of implant it into your brain, because this is another possibility to approach the problem. So let's start. So uh, of course, my area is analog design. And well, here are some cir circuit examples what we deal with, right? Operational amplifiers like this one, who may be part of um, some filter. Um, we may even go to mixed signal circuits like a phase lock loop. You may talk about analog receiver front ends, but you may also talk about um, RF circuits, or you may even think about digital gates or, you know, when you have some uh, specific types of differential equations, you may think of MEMS. So anything that is regarded from a continuous point of view, right? This is, this is something that can deal with what I'm going to present to you. Um, let's do some definitions. So 
Um, we distinguish between performances and parameters, and they are combined by simulation. So performances, this is something like um, gain or bandwidth of an operational amplifier. It's, so these are the um, properties that define the functionality of a circuit of a system. Um, and we collect the values in the vector f of all the performances. The next is we have parameters. Now, parameters are, there are three types. We call them design parameters, statistical parameters, and range parameters. So um, design parameters are those that um, a designer is, sub, uh, is, is, is improving to get the performance as good as possible. Now, for um, an integrated circuit, for an analog circuit, it's mainly the transistor widths and lengths and some resistor values. These are the design parameters. Then we have the statistical parameters. Um, in integrated circuit design, these are mainly um, transistor model parameters like threshold voltage, oxide thickness, and so on. And these parameters carry the information about the variability from the manufacturing process. They carry a statistical distribution. That is why we call them statistical parameters. And then we have the range parameters. Um, they have an interval in which they can vary, but we don't know anything about the probability where they are. Now, these two together are also called PVT parameters, right? P for process and VT because it's mainly the supply voltage and the temperature, which are range parameters, right? The circuit must work between whatever, minus 40 and 100 degrees Celsius. Now, when do we talk about performances? When do we talk about parameters? The parameters in this notation here are the input to the simulator and the performances are the output. This is, it's just a definition, right? So when it's an input to the simulator, we call it parameter. When it's an output of the simulator, we call it performance. And here is what combines both. It's the simulation. The simulation maps a set of values for all the parameters, right? X is all the parameters and this is you know, the concatenation of the values in the vector for the design parameters, xd, xs for the statistical, xr for the range parameters. Now, we put them into a simulation and get out a set of performance values. Now, for this, of course, in integrated circuits, we don't just need the net list. We need the simulation bench. We need input stimuli, including in that bench. We need to know about the process te technology, what is usually called PDK, right? So. Besides that, anything when it's about continuous, what we talk here is we can apply it for anything with point-wise function evaluation, for instance, or mainly by numerical simulation, which is expensive, right? So we don't have a, an analytical function here, but we assume that we can just simulate it point-wise. One set of values for X maps by that simulation into one set of performance values F. So this is what we have. And any problem, not just analog problems, um, that have these um, features can be subject to what I'm going to present in the following. About variability, I like this one here, although it's already 10 years old. So they tried you know, 10,000 10, million transistors and they looked at the threshold voltages of all the transistors, what they wanted to find out is if it's normally distributed. So they look at the threshold voltage nominally and the standard deviation. Well, here it turns out with that band, it's not really uh, uh, normally distributed, but that's not my issue. The point is, if you look at the numbers here, on this chip they had, the threshold voltage, which is supposed to be around 0.4 volt, right? varies between 0.2 and 0.9 volt. And if you have a supply voltage, I don't know, of 1.8 volts or something like that, this is going, this is starting to hurt. So this is just a motivation that variability is a real issue in um, circuit design and we have to deal with it. So what we need is, we need a model of the process variation on, on the circuit level, on the transistor level, right? So when we look at, 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 at some model where we do the mapping X on F in this, in this you know, functional mapping, in those statistical parameters XS, 
which are the transistor model parameters in integrated circuits, there we need to get to a model. So we don't deal with that. That's a whole own, own area and it's difficult to get that. So you get some, you know, very, some, some um, um, variance values for uh, length width or length width reduction for oxide thickness. And mainly it's about the threshold voltage. This is, this, is, this is the core parameter where you model your process variation uh, charge mobility, oxide thickness, you know, these are second order statistical parameters. The main parameter is threshold voltage. So we start from having a model of the process variation on that circuit level, right, where we deal with. This is something that you have to get to. Usually some companies give it to you by PDK. Sometimes they just give you corner cases. If you have your own FAB, you have the data. It depends. But you usually have an idea about the statistical distribution that you can use. So now with that, we can start and talk about Monte Carlo analysis. This is what you know probably. So this is what we have. We assume a statistical parameter distribution, right? Not for the XD, not for the range parameters, just for XS. So here we have two statistical parameters. We call them XS1 and XS2. There are many more, right? You could think this is oxide thickness or this is threshold voltage or this is um, threshold voltage transistor one and threshold voltage transistor two, right? They may be, this is called mismatch, they may be different. Now, what we usually assume is a so-called normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution, and it looks like this bell curve, right? This is the PDF value over two parameters. It's this function here, some constant to um, exponential minus one over two beta square, and this is this quadratic form, which means that the level contours are ellipsoids, right? In, in two parameters, they are ellipses. If you have more than two parameters, it's called ellipsoid or hyper ellipsoid. Now, these quadratic forms are nice for optimization. Quad quadratic is something that optimization can deal with. And that is why we assume this kind of distribution. And it is determined by the mean vector, right? The mean value and the covariance matrix. The covariance matrix includes the standard deviations of all the individual parameters plus their correlation. The correlation actually causes something like that inclination here of the ellipses. If there is no correlation, uh, the half axes are just according to the coordinate axis, but it looks like this in general. Now, at this point, usually the question comes up, yes, but what can we do if they are not normally distributed? Because this is very often the case. For instance, if you think of oxide thickness, uh, oxide thickness can only be positive, right? It can only take positive values. And if you have a Gaussian distribution, it, it, there is a probability to take a value anywhere, right? Also for negative values. So, so, so you cannot take a normal distribution to model oxide thickness. Well, yes, of course. But the nice thing is if it's not normal, well, we transform it into a normal distribution. This can actually be done in most of the cases. You just need a unique mapping between two variables y and z, right? So, so maybe, um, well, maybe y is the, is, the, is the true one, the oxide thickness, which is not normal, but you can map it into a normal distribution, z, by some unique function. This is possible. And actually what you do here we don't have to go into detail about these formulas. This is about variable transformation in integration. That's something you know from mathematics. So please have in mind, the real world is distributed somehow in our method internally. We transform that real world into a normal distribution because from the point of view of methods, normal distribution with this quadratic level contours is something we like very much. But always think about this is just the, you know, the algorithmic insight part. The real world, of course, is distributed, whatever, like anything, okay? What else do we have for, for these, for the Monte Carlo analysis? So we have the operating range, right? This means like upper and lower limits for these parameters. For instance, temperature, minus 40 to 100 degree. Supply voltage, I don't know, 0.8 volt to 1.2 volt, for instance. And, um, but always have in mind, these, these are parameters, these are input to simulation. 
the performance specification that tells us if a circuit is a good one or a bad one. This is what we promise to the customer. So um, actually, we always promise. We also promise to the customer about this one here, right? Your mobile phone works if it's freezing or something like that. But mathematically, the, the bounds are similar, right? So we have lower and upper bounds for our performance features, but this is similar to output. So now we have everything to formulate yield analysis. What is yield analysis? Let's go on, on, on that. So here we have our level contours. Please think about this is the mean value. And out of that you know, white screen here comes that Gaussian bell curve. So the acceptance region is the region where we can say from our performance specification, oh, that's a good circuit. It satisfies all the specified values for the performances. Now it's the cut set of all the part of all these partitions according to the individual specs. Every specs gives you a cut. Every spec, right? This, for instance, would be I don't know. Gain should be at least um, seventy dB, something like that, and that cuts you that space in two halves, right? One side is oh that's good, that's that's that, that's greater than the value. The other side is bad, that's that's less than this, and every spec gives you such a cut. This is a second one, this is a third one, this is a fourth one. Now, this is actually the region where any point here, any implementation, any value of these statistical parameters inside this region gives you a good circuit satisfying the specs. So you can think about um, the parametric yield as taking your Gaussian bell curve which is, um, it's a kind of cake, right? You could consider it a special type of cake. And with these, with all the specs, you cut away from the cake. And the cake is one or 100%. And what is left when you cut away by the specs is, I don't know, 70%. And that's your yield. That's the percentage of circuits out of the manufacturing process that you can sell to the customer. So it's a, it's the Gaussian bell cut by the specs. And mathematically, you determine the integral over that PDF, that probability density function, which is the normal distribution over the acceptance region. And this is how you write it. You integrate over that PDF, over all your statistical parameters, and you only take, um, as, or you take as integration bounds, you take these acceptance region. And the acceptance region is where all the F are less than the upper bounds, and greater than the lower bounds, right? So um, this would be something like, you know, power. Power should not be more than, area um, should be not more than, and gain should be at least that, slew rate should be at least. Here's a little difficulty. I'm not going to detail that just to give you a hint. Now, it's acceptance region in the statistical parameter space, but we have the range parameters. The range parameters is, oh, between minus 40 and 100 degrees Celsius. So for a specific set X, S here, then you actually would have to sweep over all your range parameters. Here is just a lower bound. And it needs to be inside these uh, bounds for all your range parameters, right? That makes, makes it a little bit more difficult. But yield is kind of, you know, you cut away from your Gaussian cake and that's, that's, that's an integration over a very complex region here that you actually don't know, right? You don't have a formula for this one. And now we do a trick. Instead of having these integration bounds, we defined a so-called acceptance function, it's delta. So, and it's one, if the performance is within the performance acceptance region, which is defined, right? It is. Well, if your gain is greater than, if your power is less than. And it's zero if it's not inside. And that allows you to transform this formula Y, where you integrate over the PDF, over that acceptance region, into an integral which is going over the whole space. But you put the bounds into that delta and inside the integral. That is the trick. And actually, th this is the main tricks from, trick from Monte Carlo. And you can use that trick not just for yield estimation, but for any integration. Now, if you do that, 
you look into your statistics basic book and um, you find out, oh, this is the definition of an expectation value. It's the definition that the yield is the expectation value of your acceptance function delta. What is the nice thing about that? Once we have defined it as an expectation value, we know from statistics how we determine such an expectation value, right? It's the mean value. It's a mean value of all these deltas. And that means you sum up all the delta that you get somehow and you, that, and you divide it by the number of, you, you call it sample elements that you have, right? So that's the way you create a sample. So you have NMC individual sample elements that you created such that they are normally distributed as you had defined it. And then you simulate all of them. And when you have simulated them, you have your performance values and then you know, oh, is it inside or outside these bounds that I gave? And you can easily write down one or zero. And this looks graphically like this here, right? So for our two statistical parameters, well, we have these borders here. We don't know them, they exist. But you put these individual samples here, here and here and here and here. You simulate everyone. After simulation, you know what the value of the performance is, and you can say, oh, that's a good one, that's a bad one, and then you mark these. This is plus, plus, that's a good one. Minus is a bad one, it's outside. So you get, an, you get a kind of image where these bounders, borders are, but in the end, as long as these points are normally distributed according to the original distribution, if you sum up the ones that you have, which is then the number of plus, right, which are good, divided by all of them, the Monte Carlo sample size, that's what it's called. This is an estimation of the yield. This is what we do, right? So we take a lot of um, sample elements which are distributed according to the given distribution. We simulate and then we count, that's it. We have to talk about the accuracy of our yield estimation by Monte Carlo analysis. And you get that no, you know, your, your yield estimation by a certain sample. You know, you spread them somewhere, you, set, you do one sample and then you determine a number. If you do the next sample, which is different from the first one, you get a different number. So that estimation in itself has also a distribution. And the yield estimation is very accurate if the variance of that distribution is very narrow, right? Because it, it, it is only changing a little bit from sample to sample. And here's the formula. It is the yield value itself divided by basically NMC. Okay, the good message about this one is, and that's maybe sometimes amazing, but the good message is it does not depend on the number of parameters. Well, the bad message is it depends on the sample size, but the good, good, mes good message is the accuracy is, has a certain value for NMC is 100 or 500. But then if you have five statistical parameters or 50 or 500, that doesn't make a difference. If you have 500 sample elements, whatever number of parameters you have, you have the accuracy of your yield estimation is the same because it's amazing. You could imagine that you have, I don't know, 5,000 parameters, still 500 sample elements gives you a specific accuracy. That's it. That's the nice thing. The bad thing is with that sample size here. Now, the variance determines another distribution. Under certain um, assumptions, you can assume it's a normal distribution. Now, with that, you can, you can think about, okay, how many sample elements do I need for a certain accuracy? And here comes the bad message. We usually want to verify a very robust circuit. The yield is large. So the number here tells you, and this is the bad message. So if you have a yield of 99.99% and you want to be sure that you verify that with an accuracy of plus minus 0.01% and you want to be sure, you want to be 99% sure you need 66 or let's say 60,000 sample elements. No one wants to and no one can afford to do 66,000 simulations. So here's the problem about Monte Carlo analysis. Your accuracy depends on the sample size and for 
high sigma designs for robust circuits, which we usually look at to verify that we need many, many sample elements. And now we talk about an alternative, which has advantages and disadvantages. And um, the deterministic approach is going to go over a so-called worst case point, and we will define that and the related worst case distance. So let's again take a look at this, right? Normal distribution in two parameters, Gaussian bell curve level contours are the ellipsoids. This is the function. This is that quadratic part. If it's constant, it looks like this. This Now we pick one specification. So two statistical parameters, oxide thickness transistor one, oxide thickness transistor two. Um, well, this is like um, power, a, um, an upper bound for power, we should be below that. So that's a good circuit. If it's larger than that power, it's a bad circuit. This is the distribution around the nominal value. So we would usually you know, do, do our uh, Monte Carlo analysis, but now we want to characterize that border between good and bad by one point. And now usually, and this is the disadvantage, I don't see you, I don't hear you. I hope you, I hope still you, you hear me. I would ask you, what do you think? If you pick one point to char characterize that border here, which one would you pick? Maybe we leave a couple of seconds to think about that. Which, which one would you pick? Would you pick one here, or here, or here, or this one, or one on the border? This one here, this one, this one, this one. Which one would you pick? What about this one? Maybe you already had your idea. We pick this one here. And we call this worst case parameter set. Now, please think of that Gaussian bell curve. What distinguishes this parameter set from all the other ones which are bad? It is the one among all the parameter sets which lead to a violation of the spec, which has the highest probability, right? This is from coming from here, you know, you go the, you go the hill up to the maximum, which is here. And here is, here you have the maximum PDF value among all the parameter sets over here, right? Now look at that, what a wonderful intuitive definition. The worst case point, XSW, is the point with maximum probability, correctly we would have to say density, maximum probability to violate the spec. And actually, we have not been the first one to uh, to define that. It's 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 this is coming from civil engineering. But this is our main idea to get rid of Monte Carlo analysis. Right? Please keep that in mind. We define the worst case point as the point of maximum probability to violate the spec. Okay, that's my main message. The rest of the talk, I will show you why it is advantages, okay? So one thing is that we can do with this point, right? Here it is. Now we can insert the point, the, uh, this, this point, XSW, into that quadratic form for, for beta. And then we get a value of beta, which we call worst case distance. And this is, this is, well, this is the value beta that refers to that level contour of our normal probability density function, right? It's the distance of the worst case point, XSW, to the nominal point, weighted according to the PDF. The mathematicians call this one here, it's a Mahalanobis norm, uh, norm right? It, it's not just this distance here, but it's weighted with that inverse covariance matrix, which comes from um, the PDF. Good, so we have that. Now, the interesting thing is, let's do a linear approximation of our border between good and bad in that worst case point. When we do that, after some calculation, we can determine the yield within this acceptance region as one over square root of two e to the minus t square over two, integral from minus infinity to beta w. Now, if you remember your school times, this is 
the so-called standard normal distribution. So it is the one-dimensional normal distribution with a mean value of zero and a standard deviation of one, and you integrate that from minus infinity to beta w. Hey, but this is something you don't need a Monte Carlo, right? You get for that one, for that one specification, you get the yield for that approximation here, for that linear for, for that linear model here out of a statistical table. You just have to look in, in, into any statistical book, you have it there. You know, this, there are tables for these values. That's, that's very easy. So the yield partition that you get out of that, worst case point, then the corresponding worst case distance, and then get in, go into that formula, it's the exact value for the linear bound from a standard normal distribution and the worst case distance. But, you know, this is, this is in any book, but this is something the beta becomes something like the multiple of a standard deviation, right? So beta zero means you integrate from minus infinity to zero, so it's half, it's 50%. And then you get these values that you know, three beta three corresponds to a three sigma design. It's 99 point, actually eight eight seven percent So no need for Monte Carlo. You just determine the point, you insert into that here, go to the statistical table, you get your yield. Of course, we have to talk about to get how to how we get the point. We will we will talk about that. But if you have the point and we have defined that point, it's the point of maximum probability to violate the spec. It's a wonderful, it's it, it's it's an easy definition. Okay, so now we have to talk about accuracy again. Now it's not the accuracy of the Monte Carlo, it's the accuracy of yield estimation by 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 this kind of by this kind of linear model here, right? So this is our linear model. This is the real nonlinear function. So what's the mistake that we make, right? So we, we, we miss to integrate correctly over, uh, over this part here, right? We integrate this whole thing. And so in this case here, we would overestimate that, right? Because it's, 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 kind, of, uh, it's kind of more narrow, the acceptance region. Or if it's, if it's like this, we underestimate it. We make an, est we make an error here. Does the error matter? No. So first of all, it's a systematic error, right? It doesn't depend on sample size. It depends on, you know, how nonlinear this curve is. It, de it depends on the curvature. Now you can show that it's either a greatest lower bound or least upper bound for all um, tangential models you can do to this level contour here. So. You could say it's the best we can do with any linear model. But the next thing is now, please, if our beta is already three, then the yield here is 99.9%. The mistake that we make in yield by these arrows here, it's a don't care, right? Because we want to look at high sigma designs. So, so if the sigma here, if the beta is three or six or 12, the yield is 99.99999%. Who cares about that 0.00001% error we do? No, the worst case distance anyway is, is the better measure because we are really interested. Is our robustness of a specific specification, is it three sigma or six sigma or nine sigma? Or is it only one sigma? then we have a problem. We always want to increase it over here. So it's a very good thing. So we don't have to deal with the accuracy. The main problem is how to get to the point. That's the main problem. One more question is, yes, now you've, you defined it for just one spec. What about all the specs? Here is what we do with all the specs. Well, we do, we get the worst case for each spec. So here's one spec. This is the point of highest probability violating the spec from this side. Here, it's that point, right? Over here. And then, and the fourth one. And now we have an approximation of our acceptance region. We could use it for a Monte Carlo analysis, which is, which is cheap because we just have to evaluate linear um, equations. So we could do a Monte Carlo analysis with one million um, sample elements, but 
what we could rather do is we could just look at the worst case distances and not even where they cut. Now, look at this one here. This is the smallest worst case distance. It gives a beta. Now, the yield cannot be larger than this one here, right? Because as we said before, every further spec cuts away more from the cake. So this is kind of, it's, it's a kind of upper bound, right? The smallest worst case distance is, is a kind of upper bound of the robustness. And a lower bound can be done, you know, by counting what you cut away. So what do we cut away here? What we cut away here and here? And then in these corners, we have counted twice what we cut away. So we cut away too much. So if we subtract that, we have cut away too much. So this is a kind of lower bound taking all the worst case distances as a sum. But anyway, it is better to look at the individual worst case distances. One more comment, we have to formulate the mathematical problem. Find the high point with highest probability on the other side of x s zero, right? We are here, the nominal value. We find the point with highest probability on this side. And it's the same thing as finding, you saw it already intuitively before, as finding the closest point to this one here on the other side according to these level contours. And that's, okay, sorry, that was too fast, right? It's not this one, that's too big. It's not this one, that's too small, it's this one. The smallest one, as long as you are still on the other side, it's this one. Now, this is the mathematical formulation. Find the minimum beta instead of maximum PDF, that's the same, subject to your F is on the other side of the spec. And here you have to, here you can introduce um, your range parameters in that constraint, if you want. Now, this is a nonlinear optimization problem with a quadratic objective function. So you can run optimization to find this point. If you have, but you have to do it for every spec, of course. But, and then there is a lot of, there are a lot of things that you can do to make this efficiently and so on and so on. And, de and depending on the problem, this is more, more efficient and more accurate in the end than just doing Monte Carlo analysis. I'm not going to talk about this uh, part here. Based on that result, you can also do optimization. You can find gradients. Let's take a look, finally, at an example. We take this op amp here, whatever it is. So we have um, whatever technology it is. That's what I wanted to say. So we have the gain, the transit frequency, and, as, and the phase margin. These are properties you get by AC simulation. Then you have the slew rate. This is something you get by transient simulation. We estimate the power from a DC simulation. That's the nominal value. That's the specification. So what we do is our analysis by looking at the worst case parameter sets for all five. We have done these five optimization problems. Now we get the values 2.5, 7.7, 1.8, 6.3, 1.1. .1. That's the smallest one, right? These correspond in the linear model to these yield values. This is this 86%. The overall yield was estimated then by this kind of um, Monte Carlo on the linear bounds, 80 something percent, okay? Um, it's even nicer that if we can take a look at the worst case distances. Now these are the five um, performance properties and this is the worst case distance. On the left is the worst case distance value. And you can think of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, sigma. That's your one dimensional sigma thinking. And at the same time, we can do this one dimensional standard normal distribution. This is 50%, uh, 97%, whatever. And then we do optimization. You can get a gradient as well, and then you do optimization here. And now at the end, you get these sigma values here and a yield of 99.9% based on worst case distance. Now look at this, this is a nice thing here. Look at that, the nominal value of gain is 7060B in the optimized, ca optimized case is also 7060B, but the robustness increased. So this is a nice thing, that's why you should do yield optimization. What happened here is you don't move the nominal point, it, that, that was accidentally, it happened just, but you decrease the sensitivity, right? This circuit is less sensitive towards the statistical parameters. That's why the robustness is larger, even when the nominal point is the same. Now here's the numbers in, in, in the bars. This is optimized, right? You pump up your worst case distances up as much as possible. Now, why is this the optimum here? 
the optimum actually is four sigma approximately, right? So you get this with that technology, with that circuit, with that specification, you get it to a four sigma design. That's all possible. Now, you can't get better because if you increase the worst case distance for the phase margin, you automatically decrease the worst case distance of the slew rate. And we have seen, you know, um, the yield cannot be, or the robustness cannot be better than the smallest worst case distance. And that is why this is also called design centering, right? You, you have to position yourself between, well, two trade-offs. And, you know, and the nice thing is the designer always says, yes, of course, you know, look at that. This is a, this is a trade-off between stability and speed. This is life. There's always a trade-off. And mathematical tool in that case automatically gets to that optimal trade-off here. Okay. That's all I wanted to tell you, right? So we talk about tasks with expensive pointwise numerical function uh, computation. We have looked at yield analysis. It's, it's, a, it's an actually a discriminant analysis task, right? Between where is the border between good and bad? And it's rare event because um, we actually want to look at robust systems, right? Not, not you know, 99.999 something percent yield. And we have defined a deterministic approach to get the yield. Find the point of highest probability to violate the spec. Then the yield analysis results in the multi-objective nonlinear optimization problem. And this is particularly suited for technical interpretation, you know, X sigma and for high sigma designs. And I come to the end of my talk and actually just, you know, for reading, there is also a textbook on this here, which I use for teaching. Of course, there has been this book and there is software to use. This is the company Munidav in Munich. And well, Wicked is what many people call analog design. They call it the tool Wicked. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Now I have to get out of this here and stop my screen sharing. Here we are. Okay. Thank you, Helmut, for this exciting talk. So it's a very interesting topic. Uh, it have a lot of mathematics, but I think that people... Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's normal, but uh, uh, maybe for uh, people that are not uh, uh, used with this topic, uh, it, uh, maybe it is um, uh, some kind of difficult to, to, under, to understand, uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, you, you make a, a great talk and uh, uh, you, you try to simplify the, uh, the, the the parts of this the the, the methodology. Yeah, but uh, people can make uh, questions uh, in the YouTube. Uh, this talk is being transmitted in the YouTube channel uh, uh, of Cas Rio Sul. And if you make some question, I can read the questions for Professor Helmut. Uh, I will start with a, a question. Uh, this methodology demands a model of process variation at, uh, at transistor level. Uh, this, this, this model is provided by the, the in general, by the, the, the founders in the, the PDK from the founders. Uh, how, do, how do you consider the quality of these PDKs that the founders uh, give for the designers? Are, are they adequate for this, this methodology? Uh, 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 how, how can you, you compare the, the results that, uh, of, for yield estimation with this, this methodology with, uh, for example, uh, uh, a, a prototypation uh, uh, measurement results? Uh, yes, that, that, that's a good question. And, and, and actually, this is a question that both Monte Carlo analysis and this, this, this worst case distance are suffering from. Um, it is even worse usually when you usually your FAP doesn't like to give you all the data. Some, sometimes they only give you worst case corner cases. You can you can determine an, an, an approximate distribution out of that. And um, you always have to deal with the fact that the model that you are using here for the statistical distribution is pretty inaccurate. Um, the point is that the designers usually have a good feeling of what the process does. 
So um, they are maybe adding a little bit of um, headroom there, and um, which means you make your distribution artificially a little bit worse, and then you have to deal with these values. You have to be, in the end, um, it turns out that um, the models that you get are usually pretty good from the process measurements that the FAP does for you. Um, the, the, the problem rather is that the people don't use the statistical distribution because it's a little bit tedious. And you know analog designers, they always say, never trust your simulator. So um, this happens, but um, I don't think, you know, you know about the uh, inaccuracy of these models. They are not fully accurate, but when you know, but it, you know, it's not an excuse not to use them because then the result is also, you know, inaccurate in a certain way. But at least you have a result. But it's a, it's a problem, yes. Um, and the point is, if you if you ramp up a new technology, you don't know enough about the uh, about the data. The older the technology is, the more accurate the data is you you collect about this um, this 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 process technology. That's life. Yeah. And, and for and for new technologies, this problem is 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 worse because uh, the, the the variability is increasing more and more. Okay, uh, I have another question. Uh, I think you have a question from the audience. Yes, I see it. Uh, Could the optimization be weighted by some performance domain? For example, prefer gain in place of power. Yes. Um, the, the, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, actually, the moment, of course, yes, you can do that. So, so, so the fast and simple answer is you can always, in your optimization, give weight to your individual objectives. And by that, you um, one is becoming more important than the other one, of course. But look at the problem as we defined it. The moment we have a statistical distribution and the moment we have specifications, there is no way of weighting them because the worst case distance tells you what the percentage is that is good and bad. So um, specifications together with statistical distribution gives you takes you all um, the room to to um, to make weights because it's you know the point is the robustness of one performance is two sigma and of the other performance is three sigma and then you have to look for the performance with two sigma because this is the weak point in your chain so that's an interesting thing if you only think nominally of the performances you have to you, you have to do weighting the moment you have specification and distribution, you don't you don't need any weighting anymore because the weighting is there. It's the yield. Okay. Uh, do, uh, you have shown shown uh, a design example uh, of uh, an amplifier. It's an analog circuit, but. Uh, how easy is it to extend the methodology for other kind of circuits, for example, uh, digital circuits? Is it possible to use a deterministic way for digital circuits? If um, one example is that um, the, um, the, the people are designing or are, let's say, characterizing the digital libraries, right, with all the gates, NAND, NORS, input, output, whatever, they are characterizing that for digital design. Now, when they characterize a digital library, they do it by simulation on the circuit level. And they may want to optimize their library so that, you know, that a delay for rising slope and falling slope is the same and minimum. And they do optimization on circuit level of, of the whole digital library. And this is actually what Munida has as customers because, you know, a digital library, hundreds of cells, uh, many, many different uh, input, output, slope, capacitance, and so on, and you want to do that automatically. So they, they use a, meso a method like this to simply do it automatically. Mm -hmm. Okay. This method is implemented in Moneda, in Moneda tools. 
right? They have commercialized that actually. So what I'm telling, what I have told you here is 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 the core idea, and they have done all these sophisticated optimization algorithms to do it properly. Mm -hmm. And do you have an idea uh, about the improvement in terms of, the, of design time between the deterministic and the statistic yield, yield analysis? That that would be a question to Munida guys because this is what they have to do um, with demonstrators all the time to convince the uh, to to convince the um, the managers to buy the tool. So um, there is always some improvement. Actually, um, I don't know because I I never did manual analog design. I always do it this way. I can't tell you. There there is of course improvement. Otherwise, the managers wouldn't buy it. Wouldn't buy the tool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> uh, I have no other questions from the audience. So uh, I think our time is ending. Uh, so thank you very much for this exciting talk, uh, Helmut. I think this. Oh, thank you very much for, for for the invitation. Very very yeah. happy to be there. <laughs> yeah, I think this discussion will be very useful for people uh, that are working with design automation and. Uh, must deal with the process variation for robust design. And thank you for being here. And so yeah. we finished this session. Thank you all for attending and for the questions. And bye-bye.